welcome to the RSA uh, House. This is um, an organization that has been committed to innovation for 260 years. Uh, we like to think of the RSA as the world's oldest think tank. Um, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about what goes on in this building so that uh, you have a kind of sense of your context. Um, as well as this uh, house, our headquarters, the RSA has a uh, research and uh, innovation department. We work in a whole variety of areas from reforming public services uh, through to sustainable design. Um, we do a lot of work on uh, enterprise as well, and we uh, host a major commission on city growth, which is chaired by Jim O'Neill and which is proving to be very influential in relation to changing thinking in the government, but also in the opposition parties around the need for a more city, city region based economic uh, strategy. Uh, the RSA also is a platform for ideas. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of events uh, every week, which people, great people like Mariana speak. Um, we film those events. I think 130 million RSA lectures have been watched online in the last four or five uh, years. So um, we try to bring great ideas to the world. And then finally, we have 26,500 fellows, fellows of the RSA, maybe fellows in the room, I don't know. Um, and since I've been here, one of the things we've been working with is to empower those fellows not simply to be people who support the RSA's activities, but people who are part of delivering our mission. And so, for example, uh, we give small grants to fellows to start up social enterprises or civic debates or discussions. And, we've start, and about nine months ago, we started supporting fellows to develop crowdfunding bids. So we have our own part of Kickstarter, and we've been very successful in raising crowdfunding resources for fellows uh, projects and that I think is an interesting story really because five years ago our fellows were really pa you know, passive they were kept at arm's length they were really there to support us being innovative and we have through investment but mainly through a kind of attitude shift uh, we have recognized that they are a massive source of innovation and also a big part of how it is we achieve change in the world I think there's something interesting there about how institutions view their innovative resources I think too many institutions view innovation as something that takes place in just one part of their organization, and they don't recognize the possibility of innovation taking place much more broadly across their organizations. Just a couple more points before I uh, leave you to get on with your fascinating day. Uh, I um, uh, give an annual lecture at the RSA, uh, and this year was my uh, eighth, and the theme was the RSA's new mission statement, or new worldview, which is called Power to Create. And by Power to Create, what we mean is uh, that we've, we believe we've reached a moment where it becomes possible to realistically have the aspiration that every citizen can live a creative life. And by a creative life, I don't mean a life in the creative industries, I mean a life which is meaningful and unique to them and in which they feel that they are themselves the author. Now this notion of the creative life, it has been around uh, since Aristotle, um, but one of the interesting things is from the Greeks to the Victorians, the assumption was that that notion of the kind of creative life, the life which was meaningful and unique. Uh, it was assumed this was something only open to the elite, not to the public at large. But I think that is the moment we've reached, the moment of inflection, is the possibility that all citizens can, li can live what Roberto Unger calls the larger life. Uh, and our analysis is, um, what is it that's driving us to that point? And what are the barriers? Uh, and so what we think is driving us to that point is changes in people's aspirations, and capabilities. Across the world, the World Values Survey shows that in the developed world in particular, in the developing world to a certain extent, people are moving up Maslow's hierarchy. They, what they desire now is, above all else, the capacity for self-expression. So people's appetites are changing. They want to live more creative lives. Secondly, technology, of course, is utterly transforming the scope for people to be creative, whether it's producing content, trading, collaborating, sharing. So technology has, has torn down the barriers to people choosing uh, to, to, to live creatively, broadly defined. And of course, we're only at the beginning of that process, I think. And then thirdly, both the private sector and interestingly, the public sector is demanding more creative citizens. Employers say that, the, that when they recruit people, they want people who can show initiative. Uh, they want people who take responsibility because they need employees who can, who can thrive in a very fast changing world. 
And similarly, and the RSA does a lot of work on this, in our public services, partly as a consequence of austerity, there is a recognition that the idea of delivering services to passive citizens uh, has failed. Uh, it's an offer that can't be made anymore. And so the local authorities and public agencies that we work with are trying to understand their communities and their citizens as assets. And the question they're asking is, how is it public sector interventions enable people better to be able to meet their own needs individually and collectively? So even the good old paternalistic, top-down public sector is getting the idea that actually it's businesses around fostering the creativity of citizens. So that's what's driving us to this point. But just to finish, and this is a kind of throws you into the, the things you'll be talking about today, I think, we also looked at what the barriers are to this moment of inflection. And one barrier is continued elitism. So one barrier is something which we face throughout history whenever it's come to a point of revolutionary change, which is a kind of attitude, which is, well, people don't, don't want this stuff. People just want to sit at home and watch TV. What are you talking about? People living creative lives. So there's a, still a kind of elitism. But more problematically, that elitism is inscribed in the way our institutions work. Our institutions are very often based on highly uncreative kinds of principles. And then the third element is the, the distribution of assets for creativity. And that takes you to what you'll be talking about today. Um, uh, I'll give you an example from my own life, but, uh, but, but uh, um, you're talking much more broadly about assets in the public and private sector, assets for creativity. But when I worked um, for IPPR, which is Britain's leading centre-left think tank, which I ran before I worked in number 10, we managed to successfully convince the then Labour government of the need for uh, asset-based welfare interventions. So we looked at the research which showed that small amounts of capital, just a few hundred pounds, can make an enormous difference to people's sense of efficacy and agency and well-being. In fact, small amounts of capital are much more powerful than increases in income. Uh, so we created uh, the Children's Trust Fund, which was, a additional, uh, was an endowment, a small endowment of cash for every child when they were born. Um, which kind of two levels, one level for uh, less well-off people and one uh, lower level for better-off people, and something called the Savings Gateway, which is a way of matched, matching savings that poorer people uh, created. A third of citizens in Britain have effectively no assets at all. Or a third have very few assets. A quarter have absolutely no assets at all. Unfortunately, and this is not a political point, but unfortunately both those policies, the Children's Trust Fund and the Savings Gateway, were abolished within six months of the coalition taking office. Um, and I think the, that what that demonstrates is that argument about the need for citizens to have assets to be able to set up a business, retrain, do something different with their lives, that, that argument had not really won through. Uh, um, people saw these policies as being gimmicks. They didn't see them as being linked to a deeper story about fostering creativity across society. But similarly, I think, and I know this is something that you'll be discussing today, we have to look at the way in which we distribute public and private assets. And the question for me, although I'm a social democrat, is the problem of distribution is not so much one of fairness, it's one of efficiency. That the way in which assets are currently just assets and powers and responsibility are currently distributed across the public and private sector is demonstrably not the most effective way of liberating those assets if our goal was for all citizens to be able to live creative lives. So for me, the, the stuff that you're talking about today is absolutely bang on the things that we're interested in. And, uh, I've got the pack and I'll be talking to Mariana later about what comes out of the day. Um, I hope you have a really good day. What, the work you're doing is incredibly uh, important. Uh, enjoy yourselves.